You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. <laughs> Nationalist News. Headlines of the news today, the 30th of March. Killer gets to know the real meaning of life imprisonment in the US. Phone hackers more interesting to police than grooming gangs. Government starts oil rush. The Euro report from Nick Griffin. French start targeting Muslim extremists too late. Britain promises to double its aid to rebels in Syria. Thought for the day, Syria and what we weave. UK News. The two British holidaymakers who were humiliated before being gunned down by black teenage killer Sean Tyson finally got justice as their killer was sentenced to two life sentences back to back in America. James Cusaris and James Cooper were murdered after entering Tyson's hood. Later, Tyson boasted to his friend that they both pleaded for their lives as he emptied his clip into them. When sentenced, the mother of 16-year-old Tyson shouted, I love you, to the killer. The Leveson inquiry has revealed that the police are more interested in the phone hacking scandals than pursuing paedophiles in the United Kingdom. The report revealed that there are up to five times more police and staff looking for those involved in the phone hacking scandal than protecting British children against depraved Muslim paedophile grooming gangs. The demand for petrol has risen to over 170% after the government sparked a rush to buy fuel this week. Motoring associations who represent the small petrol retail outlets have also been voicing their opinions on the matter. Meetings are already in place to deal with the threatened oil tanker strike, including mediatory talks with the union involved, Unite. Now follows the European news from the belly of the beast with Nick Griffin. Nick Griffin's dispatch this week is from the belly of the beast in Brussels. When I die, I'm due a big rebate off my stint in hell, he writes. I'm sure that time spent in committee meetings qualifies as purgatory, even one of our alliance of European national movements. We had two this week, both very necessary and covering lots of vital ground, but our European friends don't seem to have the faintest idea of how to run a meeting so as to cut out the waffle. It's no wonder they have had to turn to extremes to get their trains to run on time. Still, I'm glad to report that the early parts of the plan to have a coherent, principled, nationalist bloc contesting the new all-European political parties list in 2014 are coming together. And as my Twitter followers already know, it certainly upset the liberal leftists who are pulling out all the stops to try and get the alliance defunded. If their hypocrisy wasn't so sickening, it would actually be funny to hear them squealing about our alleged lack of respect for democracy. After all, these are the very same people who force entire countries to keep on having referendums until their electors can be bullied and bribed into giving the correct pro-EU answer. As I said in my one-minute speech on Russia the other week, they complain when elections there don't deliver the result they and their international bankster friends want. Then they go and install occupation governments in both Greece and Italy without the backing of a single voter. They really have got a nerve, haven't they? I've had several very nice notes of congratulation from campaigners to protect our fish stocks who appreciated the passing of my amendment to the Gabrandi report, drawing attention to the fact that the million tons of fish thrown back dead into the North Sea alone, thanks to the common fisheries discards policy, include less valuable target species as well as the non-edible marine life. Having mastered the arcane art of submitting amendments, and also seen several of my other ones included in so-called compromise amendments agreed by the main party groupings, I've now submitted a batch more. These are to another report by Mr. Gabrandi, this time on a resource-efficient Europe. My three proposed amendments in all involve adding the problem of oil depletion into the factors to be considered in making future energy policy. These may well be rejected because, although there is nothing more than geologically inspired common sense, the vast majority of MEPs, like the rest of our short-sighted ruling elite, are in complete denial of the problem of peak oil. But at the very least, my amendments and their likely rejection will put into the undeniable public record the fact that the British National Party was hammering away at this issue well before anyone else. Posterity will judge that, on this subject as well as on other issues such as immigration and the banking swindle, we have been right all along. 
So my thanks once again to all the activists, donors and voters whose efforts and loyalty have given me the platform from which to achieve both practical and symbolic victories. Together we will have many more. I've also made progress on the cooker front on the new flat. A patient process of trial and error, plus a little advice from an electrician, and I've mastered the hideous complexity of its touch-sensitive controls. I have also developed a theory to explain why the makers of European electrical appliances have felt compelled to replace straightforward on-off knobs on the front with security-coded multiple-touch activated controls on the top. It's all because so many countries have banned parents from smacking their own children. This nanny state, leftist poison, leaves parents in fear of administrating the one or loving taps at an early age that has for millennia taught every new generation of children that no really does mean no. So when little Jean-Pierre toddles over to the cooker and starts trying to copy the grown-ups, mum or dad now have to try to dissuade him by sitting him down and explaining in rational terms the dangers of playing with electric fire. Small wonder, then, that they deal with the problem by favouring cooker designs, which the apocryphal 1,000 monkeys, fiddling for a thousand years, couldn't manage to switch on in between trying to type the complete works of William Shakespeare. No doubt the manufacturers are delighted, because it's a great excuse to bump up the price of their new cookers and to pressure families to scrap perfectly serviceable older ones as a sign of love for their undisciplined and uncontrollable brats. Spank the little buggers, that's my advice. And we should all collectively work for the day when politically we spank the arrogant, bullying, busybody political elite who have grabbed the power to interfere with how loving parents bring up their children and the greedy capitalists who ally themselves with such leftist claptrap in order to boost profits from needlessly created wants such as cookers which need a degree in rocket science to turn on. While on the subject of culinary matters, I bought over my copy of Elizabeth Davies' classic book on regional French cookery, which I found in a charity shop the other year. I'm looking forward to a few evenings off experimenting with it and the fantastic range of fresh ingredients available in the local shops. I'll tweet some photos in due course. Food historians credit this intense and slightly eccentric work with being the biggest single factor in liberating British cooking from the baneful influence of the Hanoverians. English cookery in particular was widely regarded as the best in early modern Europe, but George I's love of ultra-plain dishes from his North German homeland created a fashion for bland food. This combined with the ravages of the Industrial Revolution to do such damage to our culinary tradition that the English language is the only one in Europe which does not have an equivalent of the French bon appetit. Hence the horrible commercial Americanism in joy does actually fill a real gap in our vocabulary just as the kitchen revolution sparked off by Elizabeth David and carried on by Fanny Craddock, Delia Smith, Jamie Oliver, Nigel Slater, Hugh Fearlessly Eats It All and Nigella Lawson, if she is indeed a cook at all rather than a soft porn star, and all the other TV celebrity chefs, has restored our national capability in the kitchen. British cooking, particularly in the so-called gastropubs, can now hold its head up high alongside the best in Europe. It's particularly good to see so many young chefs making a point of using locally sourced ingredients with their roots deep in our own culture. Black pudding, haggis, liver, pigeon, swedes, all sorts of things from our nearly lost peasant and yeoman farmer traditions are fashionable once more. You know your home, and home is very good. World News now that the shootings in Toulouse have proved to be jihadist-orientated and not the far right as earlier revealed in all communications from the media, the French president is now speaking openly of the threat of Muslim terrorists operating on French soil. Many house raids have taken place, resulting in 19 Muslim suspects so far being arrested. Since the Toulouse shooting, Sarkozy is singing a very different song from the anti-white and anti-right-wing trillings he is famous for. Other properties have been raided in France, and the authorities show no let-up in their search for suspects in their war against terror. While the British government promises to double its aid to Syrian rebels, President Assad has asked the rebels for a ceasefire. The Syrian president has every intention of making the UN peace plan a success, reports in the capital Damascus have said. President al-Assad has said that his country cannot have peace while the rebels are still attacking his forces. Japan is warning Communist North Korea over its aggressive activities in the region. 
The North Koreans, who have already upset the South Koreans over a missile launch, have now been warned by Japan that any North Korean missiles fired over its airspace will be shot down. One reporter has stated, The communist aggressor North Korea has always been the trouble in the region because of the nature of communism itself, a folly that will always fail. Thought for the day, Syria and oh what a troubled web we weave when we stoop to deceive. I may be going over well-worn ground, but I am really unhappy about the way in which we, or rather our government, are supporting the rebels. It must be well known now that these so-called protesters are not protesting about the government of the country they inhabit. They want a fundamentalist Islamic government, or what passes for such. If our government has truly got the interests of the various areas in the Middle East at heart, it would note that in the following countries there is now no law, let alone a democratic law. Examples are Libya and Egypt, primarily. Iraq was carved up and remains a sinkhole due to combined Western and UN efforts at forming a democratic government. If they can see what has happened in Libya and Egypt, namely warring factions, split by their religion, and galloping quite deservedly back to the Middle Ages, where they would have been without the West finding oil on their lands, why, oh why, do they want to unseat yet another fairly successful Arab government leader? These protesters are getting what they deserve, a man who will not roll over and play dead. If I were Assad, I would do much more than he has in preserving my people and my country. If I were Assad, the news would never get out of these protests for the West to become even more maudlin over. The Western press and media only have to have the words protesters and democracy, and they sink into a welter of tears and sorrow for what are only Islamic fundamentalists, who want total control of a country that has nurtured them for at least a couple of generations. Even now in Libya, the protesters are still finding pockets of Gaddafi sympathisers, torturing and killing them. Egypt is in bits, and the thought of my beloved Egypt with its history and pre-Islamic culture coming off the tourist grid, and indeed coming off the map in general, is heartbreaking. The Egyptian cops, who are the oldest surviving Christians, are in more danger now than ever they were under Mubarak. And yet, my friends, we are still sending more aid to these rebels in Syria. Why don't we just send in an air blitzkrieg and be done with it? We can always pander to the UN and their useless people and send a few hundred of them in to watch while so-called democracy is restored. Apart from the obvious wrong in interfering, if we had stayed out of Iraq, Egypt, Libya and now Syria, the so-called Arab Spring, being funded by the Saudis, would never have taken shape. We should be ashamed, and rightly so. Why doesn't our Prime Minister, Cam Moron, think along the same lines? After all, he has courted a Muslim president, hasn't he? I mean Obama, of course, not poor old Assad, who has had his assets frozen and the EU as usual putting its oar in by forbidding his British-born wife from travelling to the EU. What are these men thinking of? President Assad is Syrian. Most of the protesters are Syrian. And the country involved is Syria. What the hell are we doing now? Why should Assad go to the UN peace plan when it is the UN who want to try him for war crimes? If killing rebels in your own country is war crimes, then how does that put around 3,000 innocents in the Twin Towers? No war crimes there, then. The United Nations itself had been reduced to mainly African, Muslim and communist countries, complete with white Marxist liberals. A dictator, especially a fairly liberal one, does not stand a chance. We in the West should attend to our own home fires and not blow out those in other countries where we are not directly involved. People in glass houses should not throw stones, should they? And finally, scientists have discovered more planets like Earth in outer space. Millions of pounds that have been spent on this important discovery that is so vital to us all means that even if we can build a spaceship that can travel at the impossible speed of light, we can only reach the first planet, the size of our own, within 30 years. A non-scientific spokesperson commented, What if this planet belongs to someone else? You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at Radio Britain wish all our listeners a very happy and safe weekend.